Spalding and you know the late Don Eide. Um Originally, we just you know they had just cut and welded engines together, existing engines, and you know they had a concept in their mind and they worked towards it and uh, you know made some proof of concept motors, tried them on a dyno, found something that worked. They originally settled or they finally settled on a layout with uh, you know the intake and the exhaust both on the front side of the engine. And you know we'll talk about some of the benefits on why that is maybe here in a little bit, but. Um, and you know went through several iterations of you know prototype phasing and then eventually made it into uh you know its first test in the uh 440 race sled in 2002 and then eventually made it into production you know fall on production in the firecat chassis with uh you know great success and you know since then we just haven't turned back it's just it's been part of our dna since then so what are some of the advantages that we get out of having this lay down engine design so you know the main advantage first and foremost, and you know, it's kind of been an ongoing theme with this catalyst chassis, and it really was part of the theme back then too, it's, uh, it's, it's mass centralization. So having the intake and the exhaust both on the front side of the engine really allow us to get the engine to back down in the chassis and you know, right up against the track drive like we had talked earlier. And in doing so, we're able to get you know, the intake on the front side of the engine, the exhaust on the front side of the engine, um, you know, our some of our competitors, they put the their intake right, you know, basically between your legs, right? Right where, you know, really close to where the CG of the engine is. And we put our fuel there. So we're able to package, you know, our heaviest components in that area. And that's only really possible with a lay down engine. You know, some other advantages to it are just in the, you know, it's inherent strength. So the upper half of the crankcase, that's we call a pyramidal or a triangular shape. The uh, crankcase fasteners that, you know, complete or, you know, fasten the top half of the crankcase to the bottom half of the crankcase. Those fasteners are acting both in shear and in tension. So they're they're not just being, you know, pulled apart with every, you know, cycle of the engine or every time the every time the, the piston fires. Um they're 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 acting in shear as well, which gives the engine, you know, some inherent strength quality of its own. And when your engine is stiffer and stronger, you have that thick pyramidal cross section you're able to, to make it lighter with the same amount of mass, right? So you're able to, you know, not only put that weight where you want it, but you're able to, uh, to trim weight as well. We also talked in our last uh, session about the advantages and some of the um, improvements that we made to the cooling system. Some of those transfer over, obviously, into the engine design as well. Tell me what benefits do we get out of, or, or have we made any changes to the cooling design that we get out of this laydown engine? So the cooling system has maintained the same general concept, you know, since its inception, really. But it's it's unique to Articat. Um, you know, we call it a uh, um, a uh, well, we cool the cylinder head first. Rever so, reverse reverse flow. flow cooling. Sorry. There you go. And uh, our, our our coolant flow goes from the uh, water pump, from the heat exchangers into the water pump, into the cylinder head first, and then flows down through the cylinders. Where everybody else, they're flowing into the cylinders and then up to the cylinder head and then out of the cylinder head. So um, we're the only manufacturer to do that. Uh, we're putting the coolest water in the hottest part of the engine, which helps with detonation and helps us with you know power and reliability as well. I was going to say it probably contributes to the reliability that Articat is known to have. So now when we launched the Catalyst last year, we launched it with the SeaTech 2 600. Now it's not just the old, old ordinary 600 that we just brought in and slapped into this Catalyst. Some changes have been made to that as well. Walk me through some of the key changes that were made with the SeaTech 2 600. Yeah, we're able to make some pretty significant changes to the engine for uh, for the Catalyst chassis. So, um, you know, some of the biggest things we're able to do was was well, first and foremost was a crank sh crankshaft. So, um, we uh, went with a, uh, a bigger, stronger crankshaft. Um, it's actually common to our 800 cc engine. Um, it has a stronger, uh, larger pin diameter. Um, it went from a 27 millimeter crankshaft pin to a 30 millimeter crankshaft pin, which gives us some more durability. We actually ran that um, that same crankshaft in our snow cross sleds this last season with some uh, great success um, and very happy with it. Uh, kind of next major change we did was we were able to partner, and I'm sure you know anybody in the two-stroke industry knows who V-Force is. We were able to partner with V-Force with all new uh, reed manifold, reed cage for us, um, and that's been performing phenomenally for us. Um, so that's got first for Articat in a, uh, in a production snowmobile. Um, we've used them before in race sleds. First time we're going to be using them in a uh, full-on production snowmobile. Um, 
you know, some other changes we're able to make was a, uh, a new recoil. A recoil has a quicker engagement. So when you pull on the recoil, the pull force is actually reduced by about 40%, or not the force, but the, the pull length to engagement. So um, it engages quicker. You, you don't have as much, uh, as much slack to where it actually engages. Um, so, and part of that was, you know, in, in packaging with the catalyst chassis as well. Um, we have a new electrical system, a new, a new alternating current generator that has um, higher resolution on the crankshaft, um, pickup coils, so, uh, you know, we're able to know exactly where, where our piston's at with a little bit of resolution, gives us a little better strategy for fueling our engine. Um, and we've changed our oiling strategy a little bit too. Uh, get a little better use or a little better efficient use of our oiling. Very cool. Ben, you've been quiet this whole time. Is there anything you want to add that Jeremy is missing? No, nah, he's doing a good job. I mean, we took this 600 from our Procross and, and we put it in the, in the catalyst with the changes he's mentioned. And, you know, th those changes are huge. Um, you feel them and, and how it couples with the rest of the drivetrain is what the rider feels and get the power to the ground um, is key. Yeah, I don't think anybody cares more about getting power to the ground than these guys that you hear behind us, which we'll try to talk over. Uh, now let's move on, uh, move on to the clutch design, right? So last year, the year before, we released the all new ADAPT system. We carried that design system into the Catalyst chassis as well. Walk me through, first, what is ADAPT and what has been changed to allow it to fit inside the Catalyst platform? Yeah, so the new ADAPT primary and secondary uh, drive and driven clutches were designed uh, for model year 22 production. Um, so we've had a couple years in production with them uh, with great success. They're working great, lighter, narrower. Um, so up front, we knew we, we had that in our back pocket to work with, right? So we, we completely designed the Catalyst body plastic skid plates around that geometry, which results in like roughly an inch, inch and a half narrower body plastics. And that's good for every segment. That's good for getting through the snow. That's good for going through the wind fast. Um, so we really pulled that, that body panel and shrinked it around that clutch. Um, and then also we, we took the, the driven shaft and lowered it in the chassis again, back to that centralized mass segment we talked about time and time again. Um, but getting all that heavy rotating mass lower is efficient. Now Let's talk about the chain case, right? So as you can see, one of the first things that you notice whenever you pull off that right side uh, body panel on the Catalyst is that for the first time ever, Arctic Cat has moved away from a traditional chain case design and has gone to a belt drive system. Talk me through what this belt drive system looked like, what kind of efficiencies we get out of it. Just give me the high level overview. Yeah, so right at the, the infant age of the Catalyst, we, we just, we dove right off the deep end and said, this thing is going to be belt drive. We're going to figure it out. We're going to make it work. And that's exactly what we did. Um, you know, we went across all segments. We designed it to fit multiple different uh, gearing ratios. Uh, it's a very simplistic uh, design that reduces weight, rotating mass, roughly a pound, pound and a half of rotating mass is gone. Uh, no oil, obviously. Um, and it's a, it's a set it and forget it type system, right? There's no auto adjust, there's no set adjust at the consumer level or at the manufacturing level. Literally, we have predefined positions for the gear ratio, set it, forget it, go ride. Now, uh, when we talk about the differences between the mountain, the riot, and the, the trail catalysts, are there any changes that have been made or that, are there any differences between those models when it comes to the belt drive system as far as positioning or geometry goes? Yeah, so, I mean, right off the bat, we have different ratios, right, to, to suit the different segments. You know, the, the mountain sled is geared down slightly compared to the crossover and trail. Um, but like you touched on, positioning, and, and we might have mentioned this earlier in the, the previous deep dive, but positioning of that belt drive is different between the mountain and what we call the high-performance segment, the crossover and, and trail. And, and why that is is we have a desired location for that drive shaft relative to each segment to get the ground clearance we need and the attack angle of the track that we need. So in the mountain segment, you'll see it's very similar to uh, our pro cross chassis today. That was kind of the baseline. Started there, um, so we matched that. And then what we did is we rotated the, drip, the belt case about the driven shaft axis to get to that same height and ground clearance that we have on the high performance segment. And what that did was moved it up to get the ground clearance, but it also moved it back. 
roughly two and a half inches. With that, we moved the front and rear suspension with it as well. And that, coupled with the um, drive shaft location, gives the rider a further forward feeling experience. So they can get closer to the spindle, can get back, make it more rider input friendly. Yeah, we talk a lot about that. Mass centralization, lower center of gravity, that is, you know, true with the, uh, with the belt drive system as well. Let's step back actually just a little bit. Talk me through what is composed of this belt drive system. What components are there? You mentioned that we lose the oil, the chain's gone. So what, what actually makes up this thing? So it, it's real simple. It, it starts at a, a, a basic bone uh, rear case, we'll call it, um, which houses and, and, and locates the, the upper and lower bearings to accept the eccentric patent pending uh, tensioning device. And that was that set it and forget it device I was talking about. Um, so you, you got two bearings, two gears, a belt, you're done. It's pretty simple. I think people are gonna like that. Now, when we talk about that, like, are, is there any maintenance that's involved with the belt drive system? Zero. I mean, we've had durability units go 5,000 plus miles, same belt. Um, you know, last spring, uh, me and Zach heard from Dollar Dave Brown did a 1500 mile cross country durability test, same belt. Didn't adjust it, didn't touch it. It's awesome. What makes the Arctic Cat belt drive system better than anything else that's on the market? I think the, the main thing that we really hit out of the park is how it adjusts and how it's assembled. Um, we don't need any special tools, any stretchers to get the belts on. Um, it's easy to service and, and replace a belt or replace a, a gear ratio, um, <clears throat> but it's durable. And why is it durable? You know, it, it's all related back to how we, we mount our engine configuration, tying it in with the TCL torque control link on the left hand side. How that engine moves with the driven shaft and how it's isolated with rubber dampeners to the chassis, you know, really help to take that spike load out of the equation when you you land on a hard crossing or you hit a hard ice groove on the hill climb race, right? It takes that spike load away to reduce the failure. Now you mentioned briefly about being able to change gear ratios. Can you touch more on that? What do you mean? I mean, just walk me through what options are available. What difference does that make? Yeah, so we have currently three different gear uh, ratios available to, again, hit the mountain crossover and trail segment. Um, obviously in the mountain segment, you want that lower gear, you want that grunt down low. You don't need the top end speed. Um, and then on the trail segment, you want you want to beat your guy to the next bar, right? So we've geared it up accordingly to, to match the speed that this vehicle can do. And then uh, in the crossover, it's just like kind of in-betweener. Excellent. Well, that's all really, really awesome information. I, the, the one thing that I pulled away from these last two episodes is we talked in our first one about how, you know, you can look at a spec sheet and you could draw your own conclusions from there, but it's all of these components combined that really make up what the catalyst is and the performance that we get out of it. It's how the engine is combined with the clutch and the drive system and how the chassis is oriented and how the engine is oriented and all that stuff just makes for a high performing, really, really high quality machine that you really just have to ride to believe. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this, this project was multiple different teams, multiple different collaboration between Jeremy's team and my team and the, the mountain team all coming together to say, okay, what do we want to do? Well, how do we get there? And how do we make it happen on, you know, manufacturability, serviceability, and get the rider experience without any durability sacrifice, right? And we for sure did that. That's awesome. Anything else that we didn't touch on, guys, that you want to cover? Jeremy, anything from the powertrain, the engine side that you want to cover? You did it? Not right now. All right, very good. Yeah, maybe later. Ben, anything that you want to talk about from the clutching, anything like that? No, I mean, I, I think what the rider's going to experience on this thing is it's it feels quicker, um, it feels lighter. Uh, you know, when we do drag racing, comparing to the, the Procross chassis, it's what you'll see is three sled lengths gain right away, and that speaks right to the, the engine performance that Jeremy team has done the drivetrain performance, the clutching performance, getting the power to the ground. It, it's worked as a whole system, right? And we all came together and, and that's what makes this project so fun and exciting to show you guys is all the collaboration we've done. Excellent. Well, there's a lot more exciting stuff to go on the rest of the day, guys. 
Jeremy, Ben, thanks for joining us and talking to us about the powertrain. After this, ladies and gentlemen, at 1 o'clock, we have a big announcement coming. So if you're around the booth, stick around. Stay a little while. Talk to some engineers. They're wearing the green shirts. Go talk to those guys. Take a look at the catalysts uh, that we have lined up out here outside of our booth. But be sure to be here at 1 o'clock and maybe a little bit earlier because it will get backed for a big announcement. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. We'll see you at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Thanks.